Good afternoon. We're interviewing Grace E. Kimball. This is May 7th, 1998, and the interview is taking place at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. Hi, Grace. How are you? Hi. Uh, how are we'd you? like to ask you a little bit of information, first of all, about you and your family background. If you could tell us your full name. Grace E. Kimball. And if you don't mind my asking, how old are you? 77. Your last seven month. Last month. Well, happy birthday. <laughs> and um, any information about your marital status? Single. You're a single woman. Mm -hmm. And where were you born? Framingham. And how long did you live in Framingham? I think 28 years at least. I know I lived at one place 28 years. Um, and when did you move to Natick? May 1988. Can you tell us a little bit about your family background? Were you an only child? No, I'm the oldest of three. I have two brothers, one here in Natick and one in Hopkinton. Father and mother. Dad was a World War I veteran. He, he, were, he, station, he was stationed in New Jersey in the ammunition depot. And your brothers, were they involved in the military? Yes, my brother Lewis, who lives here. In Natick. In Natick. Uh, was the Army, the Army Air Force, Ninth Air Force. With World War II? Yes. And Everett was in the Navy in World War II. So there were three <coughs> of you involved in mm -hmm. service connected. At the same time, yeah. And could you tell us what branch you were involved with? I was the Navy Waves. What made you decide to join that force? Well, <clears throat> I think one thing that influenced me was the big posters at the post office, <laughs> the women in uniform, and I liked that. And then I liked uh, the idea that the, the women, women did not have to go overseas. And then thirdly, there were some people in my office that were already going into the wave. So now, how old were you at me. that time? Twenty-six, I think. And you mentioned your five or twenty? No, I, no, no, I was twenty. Excuse me, I'm twenty-one because I get had to get permission. I wasn't quite twenty-one. And <laughs> you were working at the time? Yes. And and where were you working? Uh, Kyle Bianchi and Company, and uh, construction company in Framingham. And were you doing uh, office, office work? Office work, yeah. How long had you worked there? A couple of years, I think. So it was sort of the glamour, would you I say? Probably, probably part of it was glamour, but also I wanted to do my part because I knew my brothers were already in, and I, I wanted to do something. So. And what year was that that you joined? Nin <clears throat> 1943, March 1943. Did any of your friends join with you? Not with me, but some of the neighborhood women joined later after I was in. They started coming into the service. And what about basic training? Were waves put through basic training at that oh, time? Yes. Oh, yes. Tell us about that. Well, we were sent to, um, we left Boston, we, that's where I enlisted, and we were sent to Cedar Falls, Iowa, the State Teachers College. <clears throat> Cedar Falls, Iowa. Had you ever been out of Massachusetts prior to that time? Not for any length of time, you know, vacationing in Maine or something like that, but I'd never been that far away from home. And at the State College in Iowa, what did they teach you? Well, it was yeoman school. I'd already graduated from Burdett College in Boston, so I think that's why I ended up in yeoman school. And so after three weeks of basic training, we had four weeks of uh, studying naval history and naval record keeping and English, Cheyenne typing. Can you further expand on the, the whole terminology about yeoman's school? Well, that yeoman just mean like a secretary, right. secretarial work. And naval history, how many were in your class? Oh, I don't know. Approximately. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. There were so many of us there. We just 
So it was like a college. Yeah, we went, to, went into regular college rooms for our classes every day. And it was all women? All women. Mm -hmm. But there were also the Coast Guard women were there training, and the uh, Army Air Force men were there too on that campus. So it was a huge operation. And you were there, you said, for approximately four weeks? Four weeks for that. Three weeks for basic and four mm -hmm. weeks for the yeoman school. And after yeoman school, I assume you had a graduation ceremony? Well, we might have, but I don't remember any. Okay, and then what happened <laughs> after that? They were hard to get rid of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, where did you go on from there? Well, we went on leave for a few, or nine days, and then we, our orders were for Washington, D.C. So your first official duty station was in Washington, D.C.? Mm -hmm. That was the only station I had. And you were there for how long? Till um, November 16th, 1945. And were you stationed at what we would consider to be the Pentagon? Or? No, I was at a naval uh, wave barracks, northwest Washington. And did you work out of those barracks? No, that was our living quarters, and we had to go across the street. The Navy had taken over a private girls' school, Mount Vernon School for Girls, and that's where we worked. And Tell us a little bit about your typical day. Uh, time of rising, and obviously most of the time you must have been in uniform. Always, yeah, and except, then, left, except for time off. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of hard to tell you that because we worked on different watches. Every week we had a different schedule. And we worked from 8 to 4, 4 to 12, and 12 to 8, so that we, we were getting up and going to bed at all hours. Every week we had a change of time. And what were your duties, typically? Well, that, well, we were working on, um, when, during the European War, we were working on messages that were intercepted and we were trying to break the code. And uh, then when the European War was over, we, all our work transferred to the Pacific and we did the same thing there trying to break the Japanese code. So would you consider yourselves to be some of the first groups from the National Security Administration, which now is one group that does mm -hmm. that on a continual basis? Mm -hmm. I couldn't say. Mm -hmm. I couldn't say. It, it, I think this was quite different from what we were doing than anything they would be doing. But this was all very top secret? Yes. Did you have top secret clearance? Yes, we mm -hmm. had to. Even when we left home, we were investigated for, <laughs> which they didn't skip anything. They investigated us. Everybody in our neighborhood were asked questions, and all our relatives and everything, so. Did you like your work? Well, it was pretty routine and could be deadly at times because you did the same thing over and over again. But it was important. What, what, what kind of sense did you get when someone did break a code? I, what would happen? Well, you know, most of the time, excuse me, most of the time we, uh, we wouldn't know about it, but because uh, we only did just certain parts of it and then someone else took it and worked on it. It went all through a great chain of, of people working on the messages. But um, during the, toward the end of our Sir, my service, our unit was had did break a Japanese code, and that the woman that really got the did the work on it was promoted to warrant officer without any examination. And later on, after I arrived back at home in Framingham, I received the the, the ribbon for this. Uh, oh, it was called. Uh, it's a. <laughs> It was called um, well. It was a naval, the Navy Unit Commendation Award. It was awarded to the United States Naval Communications Intelligence Organization, and uh, 
there was no publicity on that. Because at that time, do you feel they had to keep it confidential? Mm -hmm. uh, prior to our taping, you had mentioned that you were told not to discuss this mm -hmm. for any mm -hmm. great length of time. Mm -hmm. was, did you feel that this was a matter of great importance at that time? At that time it was mm -hmm. because it, there was still, still action overseas even though the war had been declared over. There was still action and, and military people were still working <laughs> sure. so overseas. Can you explain to us, because I've never seen even what would come in to break, what would you get? Paperwork that would have Numbers, letters? Oh, I don't think I can go that far. I okay. think I told you <coughs> more than I can say anything. Sure, about. sure. But it was tedious work? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you did, didn't understand exactly. You, you would find, obviously, a sequence, but not really understand it? Well, we weren't supposed to understand it. <laughs> we're supposed to do what we were told to do, our part of it, and pass it on to the next person to work on the message. Did you uh, maintain close friendships with the people that you worked with in the office? Um, I had three or four women that I became friendly with. They were from the Midwest and uh, was one from Rhode Island and another one from Washington State. Well, we did things together after, on, uh, after our working hours. We were free to go anywhere we wanted to and sightsee and visit museums and so on. Now, nowadays, women get together quite frequently and will do a lot of things in the evening together that perhaps may not have been as um, appropriate back then. I know you mentioned going to museums. Was the ability to go out in the evening unescorted for dinner, or did you did you go to certain areas of Washington, D.C. that you knew would be appropriate for the waves? Well, yes. You thought of that when you went out, but usually you were with another person or two or three people when you went. You didn't really go alone. On the other hand, there were so many thousands and thousands of military personnel in the Washington area. While you were there, did you maintain contact through letter writing or how? With your family? Yes, letter writing, mm -hmm. mostly. Now what about with your brothers who at that time were also in the service? Did you correspond with them? Yes, when I had an address for them, yes. It was mm -hmm. hard to keep up with them when they moved around so much. But Would you say that you were homesick at that time of your life? No, mm -hmm. not really. Why do you think you didn't want to go back to D.C.? It had changed a lot since we were there, and uh, I remember it with just so many people, and you couldn't go anywhere on a bus or a trolley or anything with so many people, mm -hmm. standing room only. <laughs> yeah. Now, you mentioned your friends from the Midwest and Rhode Island, and one you mentioned from Washington State. Mm -hmm. Have any of you ever gotten together since this time for a reunion? No, we never have. We kept our, carvers <coughs> we kept our correspondence. Oh, I, I noticed the other day that up to the 1970s, in that period of time, we corresponded. And then it gradually, they were married and had families, and they were busy. In the our correspondence uh, died out, mm -hmm. but, so I lost track of them. And you came back in the fall of 1945. Mm -hmm. Did you come back to Framingham at that time? Yes, I did, yeah. And um, what happened when you returned? Did you just sort of have to pick up where you left off? <laughs> I guess that you'd say that. I, I remember returning home I re and uh, retrieving my footlocker at the station in Framingham and getting the taxi home and the man took the footlocker to the front door and I rang the bell and my mother come and came and let me in and that was it. <laughs> Just like that, it was all over. Sure. Was that difficult? Well, it was kind of a letdown and so much had we'd been involved in so much before. But the newspapers did have a write-up about it. And then the uh, Sherbin Legion Post had um, 
party and for those who had returned. And my brother Everett was back by then, but I don't know where Lewis was. I don't think he was home yet. <laughs> but they did, that's the only entertainment or honoring we got. It was just it was all over with and that was it. And then uh, I didn't go back to Carla B. Yankees, although I could have. That would, the law required that if you wanted your job back, you could, you could have it. But I forget what I did after that for a little while. <laughs> so a few few years, you obviously went to do some work, and then oh, I remember. I know. I know what I did. Um, that's funny. I should forget, but I had. I waited till the following February when the second semester of college started at Framingham State Teachers College. And so I started college and completed four years there and graduated in 1949. A as a teacher? Home ec teacher. Home, Home ec. ec. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And was it called Framingham State at that time? No, it was a Framingham Normal School? No, or it was another name after the Normal School, Framingham State College, I guess it was called Framingham State College. So did you pursue teaching home ec then? For a while. Where? Um, I had a job in New Jersey for a while, and then I came back to Framingham, fin finished out a year in Framingham. And then I decided to go to get my master's degree at Cornell. And I, I, I did get my master's there in instit institution administration. And once you graduated from Cornell, oh, see, I got a job with the state of New York in the education department as a school lunch supervisor for the state. And how long did you work as the school lunch supervisor? Oh, um, about approximately 23 years, I think it was. I remember getting my 20-year pin, but. I think it was a couple of years after that. And at that time, did you live with friends or family, or did you live by yourself? Um, at that time, um, I've kind of lost the thought here. Oh, I lived in alone in Albany, New York. That was I'm get back on the track here. Yeah, I lived alone in the apartment. Did you get back to Framingham often? Yes, um, but by that time my folks had moved to Lancaster, Mass., so that's where I went. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy um, overseeing school programs regarding lunches? Yes, for the most part. Uh, the first ten years were pretty exciting and interesting, but then it got pretty, it got to be uh, kind of old hat, you might say. <laughs> So that that's a lot of paperwork and not much else, <laughs> and dealing with some government funding and you know, yes, state and funding. Well, mm -hmm. I didn't have to deal with the funding, but I, it was the supervision in the schools that I had to, and how they were preparing the lunches and whether they were following the regulations or the type of meal and everything. Now, were these record keeping? Um, how how many schools were you in overseeing? Well, I, I can't tell you how many schools, but I had, uh, at one time, I had 20 counties that I traveled in. I think I had a few more toward the end. <laughs> so the end of this, you said about 23 years, would probably bring us into the 60s, late 60s. So you must have seen a lot of changes throughout that period of time. Well, I did. I'm trying to think. Uh, I retired in the 70s. <laughs> Early 70s. Okay. And then in retirement, did you decide to come back to Massachusetts or did you stay in New York for a while? I stayed for a while, two or three years. And then um, I kept back, coming back more and more because my parents were ill. And I, so I came back more frequently. And then they died. And uh, after that was over, I moved here. 
mm-hmm. to an apartment. What do you think it was <coughs> like for your parents having three children involved in the military? And a, a well, I've often wondered about that, especially when I went in after my brothers had gone. I wondered how, how they felt about it. They never said, but they must have felt rather strained to have all three of us away. And what did your mother do to keep busy while all of her children were away? Well, that's interesting because my mother took courses and learned how to run a lathe. And then she went and worked at uh, Telecon for a while till it got too much for her. But was that unusual in that day for a woman to be working, or, or was it because of the war effort that many women, even around the well, framing that's why she did it, because mm-hmm. of the war effort, and she tried to learn to, to be an inspector on the various pieces of equipment that were manufactured for use with the, in the, in the uh, various military organizations. And what did your dad do at that time while you were all in the service? Well, my father worked at the um, reformatory for women. That's where we lived, on the grounds. In Framingham? Yeah, it's now called MCI, but it was reformatory for women when we lived there. He was an engineer in the power plant. Was it an interesting experience living on the premises of what we would know as a prison? Well, yes, but you know, you get used to it. You're living there for all those years, and it's uh, just like in living anywhere else. You get used to it. I did work inside for a couple of years, summer programs. For my summer vacation, I worked in the office for two years. Any scary moments? No, no. How important do you feel it is that you served in the military? Well, I I wanted to do my part, and I felt it was important that I try to do something. How do you feel Um, it also affected your life beyond the military? Well, of course, after the discharge, I had the opportunity to go to college under the GI Bill. And that changed my life completely because I went into teaching and then into supervision. And, and did your brothers also utilize the GI Bill to further their education? I think Everett did. I think he went to um, Middlesex Business College mm-hmm. when he got out. He was a storekeeper, so in the service. So what? What do you think? What did you think then and in fact now regarding the whole issue of the war effort, specifically during World War II? Well, I think before I went, I, I was amazed at the enormity of the, the effort. And later, as I was in, I was even more impressed because of the organization and the, you know, the enormity of everything that we were in the various military groups and the, I never knew how, I was always amazed at the organization and how they kept everything running. <laughs> there were so many people, so many military people and units and everything. Mm-hmm. I had asked you earlier to think about this too and one of the questions we are asking many of our veterans, both men and women, is how you feel about the difference of public opinion regarding veterans from World War II, from the Korean War, and from the Vietnam War, and how they were honored or not honored? Well, to tell you the truth, I didn't realize that there was any uh, discrepancy there until it started to come out in the papers about the vet- the Korean veterans and the um, Vietnamese veterans. I really didn't realize there was anything happening that was not not being done, you know. As a woman, do you feel that there may have also been discrepancies with regards to the way the waves were treated versus the um, 
foot soldier or uh, Navy personnel? Well, of course we were right in the country and so uh, there was no war. We weren't in the combat or anything so we really were very comfortable as far as the women were concerned because we were housed in comfortable barracks. It was all, all military style but um, I, I thought we were treated very well compared to what the foot soldiers would have <laughs> or any of the other organizations. Looking back now at some of the issues that have come up from some of the women that have served and they demanded that there be some recognition with memorials and there is mm -hmm. quite a beautiful memorial in Washington DC. Yes, did you right. get involved in that in any way or did you get any kind of informational pieces from different organizations? We are talking about the women in military service yes. for America. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am a, I'm a um, member of that, um, what do you call it, the uh, charter member, but I didn't get to the dedication of the memorial, but I still receive plenty of information about mm -hmm. it and, and contact for contributions all the time. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to go because I just dreaded the thoughts of those, of the crowds that would be there. And, do, do you think at any point in time when there may not be as much of a ceremonial piece that you might go and take a look well, at what they've it's, dedicated it's, to you? It's possible. Mm -hmm. At this time I hadn't thought about it, but maybe I would. Could you also expand and let the audience know about other organizations that you're involved in? You had mentioned the DAR. Yes, I did research for many years on my family background, the Kimball family, and found that there were Revolutionary War soldiers in our family. So that I spent about eight years <laughs> researching that till I got it all together and then I applied for DAR membership. and uh, So that was an interesting thing to do and I enjoyed the research part of it. And DAR being the Daughters of, of the American, American Revolution. Revolution. Are you yes. involved in any of their meetings? Yes, I'm, I'm the historian of the Framingham chapter. Archivist, historian, librarian, all in, the, all in one. So you do I'm stay still, involved? Yes, and mm -hmm. I was the recording secretary for uh, three years. And you're retired now? Yes. Completely? Completely. <laughs> so what do you do as some uh, relaxing activities? Well, uh, I'm historian of our Kimball Family Association, which is a nationwide organization. How many are involved in that? Well, we have over 600 members at the present time. Have you had any type of reunion? Every year we have a reunion for them. And where We're, is that usually held? Well, we usually hold them in we usually hold them in uh, college locations in the summer because we can get dormitory uh, facilities and dining room facilities and meeting rooms that way in the summer. We leave with your thoughts or memories that you might like to share, not only with your family but maybe with the community and also with future generations who may look upon this tape while doing some research in the future. Well, my main, th my main thoughts about that would be that people to pr appreciate what they have in this country and enjoy their freedom, but honor the country and honor the flag. And support your country and go to war if necessary. Grace Kimball, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.